Hello and welcome to episode 76. Today, I'll be continuing this series on animal physiology by exploring animal sensoria. Sensoria means all of the different organs and structures that animals use to detect and perceive their surroundings. And this is a particularly important thing when you're an organism that can move around and explore an environment. Now, in episode 52, I talked about plant sensoria, and I explored the unique but relatively limited way in which plants detect their environment and maintain a kind of primitive, floral awareness of their own bodies. This might seem obvious, but it's a really important detail. The plants can't move, so they can't attack their prey, and they can't run away from predators. There's no real evolutionary pressure for them to evolve animal-like senses, because they don't have the same ecological role that animals do. They don't do the same things that animals do. Plants will grow in one spot, but an animal will migrate around. It'll move around, finding new food, finding water, avoiding predators, all that stuff. Now, the plants don't have nervous tissue or consciousness as we understand it. So who really knows how a plant perceives what its tissue is telling it? In any case, it seems that the plant's sensory experience, when compared to an animal, is relatively limited. Unlike the plants, the animals have nervous systems, and they can move, and this gives them the capacity, and it has exposed them to the evolutionary pressure to evolve means of detecting in real time the changing landscape around them. An organism that can move around under its own will, under its own power, like an animal as opposed to a plant, well, just by having that ability to move around, you expose yourself to certain risks. If you're going to move around a landscape, there's the inherent danger of falling. Falling off of a cliff. Falling into a bog. Falling into a ravine. Falling into the den of a predatory animal. You get the idea. This risk of death is a very strong evolutionary motivator to develop more senses, to develop more means to detect the proximal world to perceive and be aware of all of the granular details of the environment immediately around the animal. This evolutionary pressure to develop some kind of awareness of the environment led to the evolution of structures that could detect all manner of inputs from the external world. If we look back in evolutionary history, the first senses that animals possessed were limited to a rudimentary kind of body awareness, handed down from their proteal ancestors. The animal has feeling in its tissues. It knows where its body is, and how its body is oriented in physical space. And it can feel basic inputs, like heat, and acidity, and osmolarity. Furthermore, the animal exists within a matrix of particles, like air or liquid water, and various actions performed within this matrix will create disturbances to the particles, and the animal can feel or detect these disturbances. So, for example, let's say that the animal is a mountain goat, and it's walking around a mountain environment, and all of a sudden, it hears a, a clacking, cracking noise. The goat recognizes this as the sound of a rock tumbling down the mountainside, and every time the rock hits the ground and, you know, hits some other rocks, it creates that cracking noise. It creates a pulsing pressure wave in the air that will get detected by the ears of the mountain goat. Now, it's also important to understand that sensory perception is so much more than just the raw informational input. Because consider the mountain goat again. The mountain goat hears the sound of a rock tumbling down the cliff. Within the goat's brain, it's processing this sound. It's uh, triangulating where it is, so where the rock is falling down. Is it, is it near the goat? Is it going to hit the goat? It can determine if it's in any danger by uh, listening to where the sound is coming from. And also, the sound of the rock falling is associated with other inputs, like the edge of a cliff that the goat might need to be wary of. And so perhaps if the goat hears you know, rocks falling down, it might all of a sudden pause and take stock of its environment and make sure that it has good footing and make sure that there's no predators like a mountain lion sneaking around above it. You know, all of these different things are all associated with this one sound that the animal has sensed. All of these tangential processes, all of these uh, association processes in the brain that are tied to this sensing the sound of the rock falling down the mountain, all of these associations like, oh, is there a predator nearby? Oh, am I near a cliff? Oh, is my footing not ideal? All of these things can help improve the, the goat's chances of survival. 
And this is just a really limited example of how a very simple sensory input actually has a very complicated cascade of responses inside the animal, inside its brain. And this determines how it responds. It's, it determines its behavior in response to the stimuli. Now, similarly, when an animal roams across the open surface of the planet, like in an open field or the Serengeti, the sun's light will illuminate the land and the sky, and light waves will be hitting and reflecting off of everything. The animal's eyes are evolved to detect these light waves, and the animal's nervous system pieces the visual input together into a coherent, real-time image of the external world. And just like with the stimulus of hearing a rock falling down a cliff, there's also a lot of uh, subtleties and nuances here as well. Because an animal, out walking around in its environment, l let's say that it sees a river or a lake. Well, it's not just seeing water, but in its brain, it's also associating this image, this sight, with drinking and survival. But it's also associating it with danger. Because where there's a water hole that, for example, uh, an ungulate from the African Serengeti can come and you know, have some water, so too can a lion come and share that water. And if there's a lion nearby, then the prey animal needs to be on alert, needs to be aware of this. And so it's not just seeing the water, but this is also stimulating association uh, processes in its brain that's making it more alert for predators. You know, and all of these things tie together seamlessly so that you have this super complex sensory network that's feeding in environmental data to the animal so that it can be aware of what's around it, if there's a predator nearby, or if there's food some distance away, you know, all these things. Now, I'm going to go into all of these senses and more in much greater detail. But first, I want, to, I want to touch really quickly on the biological operating system that makes these senses work. This operating system, this wetware, is the nervous tissue, which innervates the animal's body and forms dense connections between the sensory receptors and the brain. This nervous system is composed of neurons, and the neurons are the cells that conduct the electrochemical signals from the sensory receptor to the brain. The neurons are the biochemical highway that enables the flow of sensory information. And now in this episode, I'm going to talk only briefly about neurons and what their role is relative to conveying sensory information. But when we, uh, when we come to a future episode on the animal nervous system, in that episode, I'll go into all of this in a lot more detail. But for now, we're just going to focus on the sensory aspect of the neural system. This process of a sensory organ sending information to the brain has three basic stages, transduction, amplification, and transmission. Transduction involves the sensory cells in the sensory organ, whether it be your ear or your eye or your skin or your tongue or your nose or whatever. The sensory cells are excited from their rest position by the appropriate stimulus. This is to say that the cells in your eye are activated by light and not by sound, and the cells in your ear are activated by sound but not by light. In any case, the activated sensory cell will produce an action potential, which is like a pulse of depolarization that shoots down the neuron to a synapse where it then activates the next neuron in the circuit. This action potential travels like an electrical wave or a pulse down the axon or the, the length of the neuron. And at the end of this axon, there's a whole bunch of synapses where the signal can get passed on to all of the connected downstream neurons. And this is what enables amplification. The amplification stage is literally just the amplification of the signal as it's spread to multiple neurons. The action potential will then travel down these neural circuits until they come to the brain, or the ganglia, which will transmit the action potential into meaningful data. This is the basic process of transduction, amplification, and transmission. Now, what's really interesting is that no matter what kind of sensory cell created the action potential, and no matter how intense the input is, like a, like a loud sound compared to a quiet sound, or a bright light compared to a dim light, or a mild pain compared to a, a, a stinging sharp pain, no matter the variable, these action potentials all have the same magnitude and duration. They all appear the same to the brain. The critical detail here is, one, the frequency of the action potentials, and two, the specific neural tract or the specific circuit that's being activated, that's carrying this action potential. So for the brain to determine, for example, that one sound is louder than another, the activated cells in the ear will send a higher frequency of action potentials than they would if they were hearing a quiet sound. Furthermore, sensory receptors have an internal specialization within each sensory organ. 
So, for example, there aren't just generalized ear neurons in the ear that hear everything. There are actually specific neurons that activate only for particular pitches. And thus, these sets of neurons are specialized at detecting those pitches of sound. This is analogous to certain specialized neurons in the eye, like the rod cells and the cone cells. The rod cells detect brightness, not so much color, and you use your rod cells to see when it's really dim out, when it's really dark out, and there's, there's not much light. And this is why when it's really dark, things often look black and white. On the other hand, the cone cells sense color and hue and saturation, and so when it's bright out and your eyes can pick up all of, all of this different information about the, uh, the color environment, like the color of the sky, the color of the ground, the color of the leaves on the trees, all this stuff, these are your cone cells picking up the, the different wavelengths, like green light or red light or blue light or whatever. And this is again analogous to the specialized neurons in the skin that detect different environmental conditions like pressure, heat, or pain. It's really important to understand that there, there is this specialization of neural sensory cells, and it's just as important to understand that all of these different types of neurons connect to different regions of the brain. It's these distinct regions in the brain that receive action potentials from all of the different types of sensory cells, and this organization allows the brain to translate those action potentials back into specific types of input and then piece all of this information together into a coherent, real-time awareness. Okay, so now that I've explained the basics, <laughs> the very basics, of the neurochemical wet work, it's time to look at each type of sense individually. Now, I've mentioned the ear a few times as an example, so let's start here. The ear is a sensory structure that animals use to detect sound. Specifically, the ear detects changes in air pressure that are created by stuff doing things, you know, anything that makes noise, like a rock falling off a cliff, or a hoofed mammal stepping through a field, or a snake slithering through the grass, or a bird singing its mating song. All of these things create sounds, and sounds are the organic perception of these pressure waves vibrating through the air. Because the ear is detecting pressure changes, it's detecting a, a mechanical input from the environment, you know, the, the changes in pressure in the matrix of particles, the sensory receptor is called a mechanoreceptor. In vertebrate organisms, most of these mechanoreceptors take the form of a hair cell, which is a cell that has a cluster of thin columnar projections coming straight out of the top. These columnar projections are called stereocilia, and they're all connected by a thin mesh network of actin filaments. So basically you have a bunch of these, these columns that are all wrapped together in a net of actin filaments. When a pressure wave comes through, the pressure wave will push against the stereocilia and cause them to bend and this bending will cause the actin filaments to stretch. If the stereocilia are bending in the right direction, the tightened actin uh, fibers will open up potassium channels in the cell membrane. This causes positively charged potassium ions to rush into the hair cell, which will then depolarize the membrane. This depolarization triggers calcium channels to open, and calcium ions will flow into the hair cell. The calcium ions will facilitate the movement and the release of other neurotransmitters, you know, other chemicals that will help carry the signal from the hair cell to the postsynaptic neuron. And from here, it'll carry the signal down the chain of neurons to the brain. All animals have a certain frequency range that they can hear. Humans have a uh, hearing range that encompasses a, a broad range of frequencies that we can detect. But anything outside this range is either too low or too high for our hair cells to, to pick up and to be activated by. Now, other animals, their hearing ranges, you know, the range of frequencies that they can sense, it might overlap with humans, but it also might extend past the range that humans can hear. And so a very basic example of this is a dog. A human can blow into a dog whistle to make an extremely high-pitched noise. It's much too high-pitched for a human ear to hear, so it sounds silent to us. But dogs have a hearing range that extends into these higher pitches, into these higher frequencies. And so the dog can hear the note from the dog whistle as a very high-pitched squeal. Another common example can be found in bats, who repeatedly emit high-pitched noises called ultrasounds 
which can bounce off of nearby surfaces to create ultrasound echoes. The bats can detect these ultrasound echoes with their inner ear, and based on the timing and the intensity of the echoes, the bats can figure out the distance to, and the shape of, nearby objects and surfaces, and this gives them a complex awareness of their environment. This echolocation, or biological sonar, is extremely sophisticated in bats, to the point that they use it as their primary means of navigation. They navigate more accurately with sonar than they do with their eyes. And uh, contrary to popular belief, bats aren't blind. Their eyes work just fine, but their ears are better, and correspondingly, the parts of a bat's brain that processes sound is disproportionately large. Conversely, elephants are known to communicate with infrasound. Infrasound frequencies are so low that the human ear can't detect them. We can't hear them. But the elephants can use these infrasound frequencies to stay in contact with each other over huge distances. The elephants will make these super deep infrasound noises with their mouth, and much like a heavy bass note, they can travel extremely far. Elephants that are separated by many miles can actually stay in touch and communicate with each other with infrasound, which they detect not just with their huge ears, but also with their legs. Their legs sense the vibration in the ground itself. Now, I think that this is kind of incredible, because it's like the elephants have this borderline superpower. The elephants can talk to each other over an entire landscape, in a frequency that few other animals can even hear. The mechanoreceptor hair cell that's responsible for all of this sound detection exists in numerous vertebrates. They exist mostly in the ears of land-dwelling vertebrates, but they also exist in fish and amphibians. But in these more aquatic animals, the hair cells exist uh, not in ears, per se, but instead in sensory organs that form a lateral line. The lateral line is a linear series of pores, or nodes, that detect vibration in the water. They allow fish and amphibians to detect the pressure waves created by organisms in the water as they swim around, looking for a mate, or looking for food, or trying to avoid a predator. This means that prey fish can actually detect the movements of nearby predators, but it also means that predatory fish can feel and follow the vortices in the water created by their prey fleeing away in Piscean terror. The lateral line also allows fish to detect their prey in the absence of light. So consider this. If a fish is a nocturnal hunter, or perhaps the fish lives in a deeper part of the ocean where no light can reach, or perhaps it lives in a shallow part of the water where, yes, there is light, but there's also a lot of mud that gets kicked up a lot, and so the, the watery environment can often be very muddy. In any of these cases, the fish can't always rely on its vision to detect prey, and so the lateral line provides a sensitivity that more than makes up for this lack of light. In some species of fish, this lateral line has evolved into a kind of electroreceptor organ, which is sensitive to electrical fields. So, because the nervous system involves charged ions and cell membrane potentials and depolarization, it should be clear that the nervous system is an electrochemical system. The nervous tissue emits a weak electrical field. Now, muscle tissue is highly innervated with nerves, and so muscle tissue emits these electrical fields as well. Animals that have an electroreceptor organ can detect these electric fields, and use them to sense and track other animals. It's important to clarify that the animals with this sense are almost always water-dwelling animals, like fish and amphibians. And this is because water, like the salt water in the ocean, is a tremendously better conductor than dry air. And so, it enables these weak electric fields to be detected in the first place. Consider the shark. Sharks have an organ called an ampulla, or an ampulla which is lined with hair cells that are maintained at a certain voltage. When these hair cells are exposed to an electrical field, the hair cells can depolarize and relay the signal to the shark's brain. Animals like the electric eel have a massive electric organ that can induce a 500 volt change in the electric potential of the water, so these electric eels can basically pump one amp of current into the nearby water. And this is enough to shock and kill prey that's as large as a grown man. Animals like electrogenic fish create arcing currents with organs in their tails, and things that get caught in that current, 
will disrupt it with their own electrical fields, and so the fish will be able to detect them. Perhaps one of the scariest things about these electrosensory organs is that, say you're like an herbivorous fish, you know, you're prey for a lot of other animals, and you're just swimming around, minding your own business. Perhaps it's dark in the water, so you feel a little safe because nothing can see you. Or perhaps it's really muddy, you know, and for the same reason, nothing can see you. If a predatory fish with an electrosensory organ happens to come by, they might not be able to see you or smell you, but what they can do is, using their electrosensory organ, they'll be able to, to sense or detect the electric fields created by your muscles. And so say you see this predatory fish before it sees you, and you're trying to get away from it. You know, you're, you're kind of freaked out. You don't want to get eaten, so you're trying to swim away. Well, this predatory fish can sense that electrical activity in your muscles as you're trying to swim away. And that can actually reveal you to the predatory fish, which will then bear down on your location, sensing your electrical fields, and it'll eat you. That's pretty terrifying, because how do you hide from that? How do you shut down the electric fields in your muscles so that these predators can't detect you? You can't. That's what makes it so scary. Now, another important sense is the ability to sense heat. Thermoregulation is a critically important part of life for animals, and being able to sense heat and temperature is key to that. Various types of thermoreceptors depolarize in the presence of heat or in the presence of a lack of heat. If you pick up something that's cold or you touch something that's really hot, the specific thermoreceptors will activate and relay this information to your brain. As you could probably figure out, thermoreceptors exist in the skin, and they help the animal detect the temperature of the ambient air, or the water, or uh, any specific stimulus that it happened to come into contact with, like perhaps the animal, like a reptile, crawled onto a hot rock that's been baking in the sun. This hot rock is going to be a lot warmer than the soil or any nearby leaves. And so the reptile can sense that and be like, oh yeah, this is a really good place to just hang out for a while and recharge my batteries. These thermoreceptors also exist within the organism's body, even within the neural tissue of the central nervous system. And these internal thermoreceptors are used to monitor the internal body temperature and respond to temperature changes. Being too hot will cause the animal to sweat, or pant, or open its mouth to lose water from evaporation, or to seek out water to dive into, or mud to cover itself with. All of these things will help the animal cool down. But if the animal is too cold, you know, if there's a lack of heat in the environment, then this stimulus can cause the animal to shiver or burrow, or huddle together with other individuals, or perform some other kind of heat-generating or heat-conserving behavior. Now, what's really interesting is that if you touch something that's extremely hot or extremely cold, your brain doesn't actually get signals from the thermoreceptors. Instead, if the stimulus is extreme, it'll get signals from the nociceptors. These nociceptors are pain receptors. They detect pain. So if you burn yourself, or if your tissue freezes, or in a more general sense, if the tissue gets damaged from an abrasion or a puncture or a laceration, these nociceptors will generate the sensation of pain. Now you might wonder why the body would go to all the trouble of creating receptors to detect pain. Because being in pain really sucks. But the thing is, this is actually a super important sense. Because being able to detect pain is a huge behavioral modifier. It encourages the organism to not engage in dangerous behavior and to avoid dangerous things, because pain is a deterrent. Pain is also a way of detecting if something in the body is wrong or broken, and the animal can compensate or alter its behavior so as to minimize risk of further damage as it heals. Now, one of the most important senses, especially for humans, is vision. Vision is photoreception, or the detection of light waves with a structure called an eye. Much like the sense of hearing, the sense of vision varies wildly across species. Apex raptors, like falcons and eagles, have incredibly good eyesight. They need to have extremely sharp vision, so as to be able to detect the movement of little prey animals on the ground while the bird is flying high up in the air. Nocturnal animals, or fish that live in the deep ocean, have exceedingly sensitive eyes, and this gives them extremely good vision in low-light conditions. 
However, other animals, like those that dwell in caves, may have evolved to become blind, because vision is useless in a pitch-black cave, and so it's a waste of resources to grow and maintain the eyes. I mean, just consider this from a caloric perspective. Your brain uses a lot of calories, and the caloric demand on the brain, just for visual information by itself, is really high. And so if, if you live in an environment where you can't see, because you know, it's dark all the time, and you don't need eyes, there's a pretty strong selective pressure to lose the eyes, because that sense is calorically and metabolically expensive. Now, in insects, the eye structure is called a compound eye, because their eyes are basically composed of thousands of smaller little eyes. When you look at an insect's eye, it looks like a bubble that's covered in scales, or dots. These dots are the lenses of a column-shaped structure called an omatidia. Insect eyes are packed with hundreds or thousands of these omatidia, and each one works kind of like a pixel in a computer screen. Each omatidia lens focuses a small portion of the visual field onto a small handful of receptor cells, and when thousands of these omatidia are operating together, they create a pixelated visual perception of the outside world. The visual resolution will increase directly with the number of omatidia, much like the resolution on your computer screen will increase directly with the number of pixels. The eye of a vertebrate animal is larger, and both more and less complex from certain points of view. Where the insect eye has many hundreds of lenses, the vertebrate eye only has one lens. But this lens, and the single mass of associated receptor cells, forms a much larger and much more complex overall structure. The compound eye evolved only once in an arthropod ancestor, but the vertebrate eye, also called a simple eye, has been evolved multiple times. It has various forms, but it works on the same general principle. The simple eye is like a hollow, fluid-filled sphere that lets light in through a pinhole at the front which then projects along the light-detecting cells along the back inner layer of the eye, called the retina. The light will first go through a transparent layer called the cornea, through the iris and the pupil, and then into the lens. The lens focuses the incoming light so that it projects a sharp image along the retina, which gets perceived as a clear, crisp, focused image. The retina possesses light-detecting cells called rods and cones, which are embedded in a darkly pigmented layer of epithelial tissue. The rods and the cones detect light in different ways. Cones detect color, but they aren't very good at detecting brightness. And on the other hand, the rods are not particularly sensitive to color, but they're great at picking up dim light and detecting brightness. Rod and cone cells are common across the retina, but there's a particular spot that's only covered in cones. This area is called the fovea, and when you focus on an object, when you stare intently at it, the light is being focused onto your fovea. This maximizes its resolution, and thus the detail, that you can visually perceive. On a cellular level, the rods and the cones possess a protein complex called rhodopsin, which is composed of an opsin protein and a retinol pigment. Each rod and each cone has many thousands and thousands of these rhodopsin molecules, to maximize their ability to detect light. When a photon strikes and gets absorbed by a molecule of retinol, the 11th carbon atom in the retinol will change its conformation, and this will make the retinol close its ion channels, feeding to the nerve cells. So, unlike hair cells, the rod and cones initiate a series of reactions that create action potentials by decreasing the amount of neurotransmitter that they send out to the neurons. While the retinal molecules react to the light, the opsin molecules control what wavelengths of light they react to. Different kinds of opsin molecules make the cones sensitive to different wavelengths of light, just like various hair cells are more sensitive to different pitches or sound frequencies. The animals have evolved various types of opsins to optimize their fitness and their environment. For example, fruit-eating primates have opsins that are sensitive to wavelengths of light around 550 nanometers, which gives them a really good capacity to distinguish between ripe and unripe fruit. Some animals like birds and insects can actually see ultraviolet light, which exists beyond the violet end of the human visible light spectrum. Seeing ultraviolet light 
allows these pollinating insects to detect certain flowers, and it allows birds to detect certain patterns in their plumage. When the opsin lets in light, and the retinol changes conformation, the decreasing amount of released neurotransmitter causes a depolarization in the neural cell immediately attached to the rod or the cone cell. The first neural cell is called a bipolar cell, and it feeds the data from the sensory cell to a ganglion cell, which is another nerve cell that has a really long axon. All of these axons from all of these ganglion cells coming off of each cone and each rod are all bundled up together into the optic nerve, which flows deep into the skull, immediately under the cerebrum and above the cerebellum, to the optic cortex at the very back of the brain. In my opinion, some of the most interesting senses are the chemosenses, or the chemoreceptors that allow the sensing of various chemicals. Chemoreceptors detect particular types of molecules, which give the sensing organism some clues about what it is that they're tasting or smelling. The sense of taste and the sense of smell are both chemosenses, and both of them are extremely basal and vital to an organism's survival. The sense of smell is used to detect chemicals in the air or in the water, which gives the animal a degree of awareness of what's in its surroundings, like the delicious scent of food, the stimulating pheromones of a potential mate, or the stench of a dead body. Smell, or olfaction, is based on the detection of odorants. Inside the nose, the membrane is covered in a layer of mucus. These odorants will diffuse into the mucus, where they bind to membrane proteins of neurons, of neural cells, and these neural cells, in turn, send their action potentials up their axons to a structure called an olfactory bulb. Because there's a huge range of odorant chemicals, there's also a huge range of receptor proteins that are used to detect various types and classes of odorants. However, individual olfactory neurons only express one type of receptor, and all the neurons with a specific type of receptor feed their data into specialized nodes of neural tissue in the olfactory bulb called glomeruli. So the olfactory bulb is packed with little glomeruli nodes, each one specialized for detecting and processing certain types of scents of odorant chemicals. The expression of these receptor proteins, and thus the sensitivity of the animal's nose, varies from species to species. So, for example, consider the wolf and the moth. Both wolves and moths have hugely sensitive olfactory bulbs, with thousands of different kinds of receptors and millions of olfactory neurons. Humans, in contrast, have a relatively poor sense of smell. We have a relatively small number of olfactory neurons, and about half of the genes that we have for these olfactory protein receptors have been mutated into a state of non-functionality. They've mutated and essentially are broken, and they don't work anymore. Now, there's a specific type of odorants called pheromones, which are chemicals released by one sex to attract a member of the opposite sex, to influence their behavior so as to attract them and initiate mating. These pheromones are detected by the vomeronasal organ, which is similar to, but separate from, the olfactory bulb. This vomeronasal organ exists in many animals, from insects to reptiles, and it comprises a powerful aspect of animal mating behavior. The other major chemoreceptor is the tongue, which detects the quality of food through the sense of taste, also called gustation. The receptors on the tongue are called taste buds, which possess about 100 sensory cells with taste receptors. The tastes that we perceive on our tongue when we eat food are a result of the chemicals in the food interacting with these sensory cells. For example, the sensation of a sour taste is caused by acidic waves of hydrogen ions, or protons, flowing into the cells and depolarizing their membranes. The more acidic the food, the more protons there are, the more sour the taste. Now the taste of salt is generated in a similar fashion, except instead of protons, it's sodium ions flooding into the cell and depolarizing the membrane. The sensation of an umami flavor, or a protein flavor, is generated when amino acids like glutamate bind to a pair of receptors on the taste cell membranes. The sensation of a sweet taste, or a sugary taste, is also generated when sugar molecules bind to a pair of receptors. One of these receptors can bind to numerous different types of sugars, which is why these different kinds of sugars all taste comparably sweet. 
In contrast, for the sensation of bitterness, there's a large family of receptors that bind to a huge variety of different compounds. And this actually serves a really important evolutionary purpose. Stuff that's poisonous, or toxic, or inedible would often taste bitter. Animals evolved a wide-ranging sensitivity to bitterness because it was often literally life-saving. If you bite into something and you taste the bitterness of a dangerous chemical, it'll make you stop and spit it out. And if you're an animal that lives out in the wild, this will potentially keep you from eating poison and dying. Now before I move on, a really cool little detail that I want to give you is about uh, the taste of sweetness. So cats, like your house cat or a lion or a tiger, they actually can't taste sweetness. They can't sense sugar. Now at first, you might be like, oh wow, that's kind of lame. You know, that kind of sucks for the cat. It, it, can't, it can't taste anything that's really sweet, and sweet stuff tastes good. But the thing is, is that cats are exclusively carnivores. And as carnivores, all they're doing is eating meat. So they're eating a lot of protein. So they, they can sense the umami flavor, but they don't really eat cellulose. You know, they don't really eat plants, so they don't really break down all of these plant sugars. They don't really eat sugars that much entirely. I mean, they eat the sugars that are in their prey animals, but the amount of sugars in their prey animal's tissue is relatively low. And so they don't need to be able to sense sweetness. It was just one of those redundant, unnecessary things that after a while, evolution just got rid of. Do you recall how earlier in the episode I talked briefly about electric fields and electroreceptors? The electric force is one and the same with the magnetic force, comprising the electromagnetic force, which is one of the four fundamental forces of the universe, alongside gravity and the strong and weak nuclear forces. The cool twist is that, unlike an electric field, a magnetic field can be detected easily in the air. Animals that can detect magnetic fields are surprisingly common, despite the seemingly exotic nature of the sense. Many vertebrate and invertebrate animals are known to be able to detect the Earth's magnetic fields, but this is an ability that's even found in fungi, and even in organisms as simple as bacteria. Scientists aren't entirely sure how the magnetoreceptor system works, but they think that it might involve iron deposits, or iron particles, suspended in a type of sensory cell. These iron particles align themselves in accordance with the magnetic field, and the animal can somehow sense this alignment and use it to become aware of its direction relative to the Earth's magnetic poles. This magnetic sense is used most commonly in birds as a means for navigation, which really helps them on their transcontinental migrations. However, in birds, this sense is used in combination with vision. If the birds have their left eye covered, they can still navigate with a magnetic field. But if their right eye is covered, they can't. That's really strange, and we still haven't figured out why exactly this is, or what it is that the birds are seeing out of their right eye. But what this does make clear is that senses are used together. As I explained at the beginning of the episode, an animal uses and combines all of its sensory input to create a coherent sense of awareness, a coherent perception of the world around it. And it uses either all of its senses all at once, or a combination of its senses to perform various behaviors like attracting a mate, or migrating, or evading a predator, or chasing after prey. This combination of sensory information, which gets processed in the brain and associated together, is what allows animals to take, you know, raw sensory input and create this rich, detailed perception of the world around it. So, to summarize the episode, the sensoria feeds physical and environmental input into the biological organism, translating these inputs into electrochemical signals that get sent to the brain, where they get organized and translated into an understandable perception of the world. The sensoria are the animal's tools to experience the world outside its body, beyond the limits of its flesh, to become aware of the world around it in a very visceral sense. Now you are an animal and you have an awareness that is composed of your abstract thoughts and emotions, which are inseparably integrated with the things that you perceive with your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, and your skin. These are your sensoria, and they allow you to navigate your body along the surface of this world and experience its vibrations and its energy in the most personal, visceral sense imaginable. All right, that's about it for Animal Sensoria. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, give it a like and share it with a friend. 
The next episode, episode 77, will be exploring the biology of animal reproduction. It's going to be an informative and mind-blowing episode, so be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can check it out right when I post it. And as always, thanks for listening. Thank you.